who's thirsty. Who wants something else now, Bobby? All right, so I'm not sure if this can keep working because I'm typically moving around. Um, but I'm the last talk between here and now. So I perfectly understand if you brush out because I mean, beer or boring computer stuff. I can imagine what you prefer. I'm going to talk today about how we went from building a software as a service platform to actually having to deploy that on prem for a number of customers um, and the pains that came with that. So, for those who don't know me, um, my name is Chris Beltacht. Um, short summary, if somebody starts by talking DevOps and you don't like it, you can blame me. If somebody starts by shouting about DNS, blame me. That's basically what people do all the time. Like, DNS is broken, they blame me. If people have not understood DevOps, they blame me, whatever. Um, what am I doing as a day-to-day -day job? I use open source to help people deliver software. I did it for a company called Inuit. Why I'm saying this is because basically it's a journey of a couple of our pains. I mean, we, we do a lot of things. We do consulting, we do custom development, we do operations. And this small part here is we run a number of really niche software as a service platforms, uh, all using open source tools. And this one is the example I'm going to talk about today. Um, who has ever heard from me of Medium Mosa? Julian? You? Yeah, there, there's at least three people in the room. It's three people who actually have been in talks I gave before. Um, <laughs> Medium Mosa is an open source project. It's basically a Drupal distribution which as main goal is digital asset management. Uh, to make it really sound ugly, this is your private own YouTube. I mean, the idea was if you put content on YouTube, you're like, hey, ads and stuff. And this is a platform that allows you to manage those assets and do all of that in an open source way. Um, the biggest consumers and the biggest users of this tool currently are universities, and a lot of government institutes. So it's an open source tool, it's PHP based, it's a land stack, it has a bunch of components. Um, the project is, I think, getting close to 10 years old now. Um, <coughs> and a lot of people run it on their own, but we offer it as a service. And that means we have development and acceptance, testing, and production platform for all of those things. Uh, Basically, it's a bunch of web servers, it's a bunch of database servers, it's a bunch of search servers, it's a bunch of servers running the web tech jobs, um, some streaming, some a lot of miscellaneous things, and they all run on centos, obviously. Um, a couple of those boxes initially ran on Debian, but we standardized on centos years ago. So how do we deploy this? How do we manage this? Um, it's a service, it's run somewhere in what you could call the public cloud. Only we use things like Hester and OVH because they're 10 times as cheap as Amazon and I can spin up physical machines in 120 seconds while they're working machines and use my own virtualization stack there. But basically it's, if we need to scale out, we spin up more machines. Um, we don't have our own hardware. We grow as we need. And we chose a long, long time ago to automate all the things we covered. Um, every single change in the platform is going through CI pipeline. It's managed by Puppet. We use orchestration tools like M Collective to say, hey, do this on a number of machines together. And we think and we live in a mindset of continuous delivery and continuous deployment. And this is where it starts to become interesting. We're running a software as a service, which means basically we have full control over saying when we deploy, why we deploy. And that means for a lot of our code, when the quality is good enough, we just go straight to production. Our purpose code, deploy to dev environment, tests are successful, 
we trigger them to UAT to production. There is a lot of feature flags in that code base, so we can basically flip on things and say, hey, we're going to go to production, but these and these things are still not turned on. And that runs pretty smooth. For the application, it's a different process. We're basically we continuous integration in F. We continue to deploy to UAT when those tests are successful. And then we decide when we move to production, but it's we who decide. And the other complexity is when we have other customers who are going to deploy it, and then we continuously wait for customer permission. It's also kind of continuous. I'll come back to that part later. So, testing. <coughs> we had a lot of issues with testing back in the days. I mean, developers were testing things on their versions of PHP. They were running unit tests, and they worked on their machine, on their platform. So, we fixed that for those things by standardizing on our PHP versions, by standardizing our platform, which we could give them, which was basically um, sent us with PHP. And we added tests there. We let Jenkins do all the work for us, and that solved a lot of problems. As you'll see, our complexity will start to grow, and manually managing a Jenkins stack was starting to get problematic. So we moved to Python as code. So come back to those things later. Deployment, testing. I'm actually going backwards in this, but version control. Um, every single part of that software as a service platform is in Git. Every single change, both on software level, on application level, on infrastructure level, everything is under source control. Um, we live by master-only development. I think feature branching is an anti-pattern. Um, it only gives you problems. It's merging, it's merging hell. And we use Git submodules as release management strategy. And we have one super project where the submodules that we use, those are references where we point to. A lot of people use things like librarian or other tools to manage the dependencies or use versions. But basically what a tool like librarian and things like that do is they, they just map Git hashes in another way. And we use for a lot of those projects, we just use plain Git with some modules to do release management. So that brings us to doing infrastructure as code, doing platform as a service, doing software as a service. Should be trivial, right? I mean, running a platform like that. We package every piece of software we have. Um, we use operating system packages because we get consistency, we get security updates, we get dependency. If somebody modifies a file on the platform, we can actually trace those changes. We can actually notify people like, hey, somebody manually logged onto the box and changed something, which typically doesn't happen anymore, but it used to happen. Um, and for us, there's three kinds of files on a platform. There's files that have been put in place by a package. There's configuration, which is managed by the configuration management framework, the puppet. And there's actually user-generated data or log files. And those are the only three types of files we have. Two out of three of those files we can actually fully reproduce. The third kind, the user-generated data, is the stuff we need to back up. That's the only thing we really care about. Um, there's more reasons why we use packages, and that's, well, if people want to just install something from the internet, and Upstream has decided to remove those links while well, you're screwed. Or you might not actually be able to deploy things because, well, who knows? You might end up deploying somewhere behind a corporate firewall. So packaging all pieces that move into the platform is what we typically do. And it also gives us, because we have automated a lot using Jenkins pipelines, it gives us really little overhead when we do that. Um, another thing is when we start talking to developers and we need to talk about how do you want to have this deployed? The moment we discuss packaging is actually the perfect moment to figure out, hey, uh, so you write log files there, you need this, this configuration file, and we actually have a discussion point in time where say these, these and these components work together, and we package them together. There's only one thing that doesn't do automatic packaging, that's config, um, because that's going to change, that's going to evolve during the life cycle. And then by using creating system packages, there's typically a really easy pattern which we can use, which is a package config service pattern where 
for every single service we run. There's basically three components. We need to have the package installed, we need to have the config controlled, and we need to have the service stopped or start. Um, stopped or start because sometimes this is managed by a high availability framework. We don't want to have the package to automatically start the service like some other distributions do, um, because we want to have control. So, source control builds packages, deploys them in repositories. So, we've also been thinking a lot about how do you manage repositories? How do you make sure that you can always rebuild what you have in place, that you can always rebuild a stack, whether it's development or acceptance or another version, and don't have problems in there. And then we came to the point where a lot of people realized, well, you need to have unique repositories for your environments. You need to have full CentOS repositories for your development environment. You need to have full CentOS repositories for your acceptance environment. And you need to have them for production. So this is what our stack looks like. Um, there's the internet, and a bunch of repositories. There's a bunch of repositories where we need packages from. And throughout the life cycle of our stack, we basically mirror everything on the internet which we need. This is our local mirror. It's uh, called Pulp. You might know Pulp. It's a great tool. It has some advantages and disadvantages. Um, this now is not here yet. Um, one of the biggest disadvantages we figured out with Pulp was the Mongo dependency, but that's going to be gone soon. Oh, Dennis shows up. Um, but it gave us the opportunity to actually have lots of copies of the same repositories and only have ones on disk. Um, what we do is we basically take a bunch of repositories from upstream, we cherry pick that into our upstream repository. Then we have a bunch, actually this repository is the custom repository which is supposed to be a rebuilt of packages where we have slight modifications. Over the years we've seen that shrink to almost none. It used to be four or five years ago, we actually had a lot of packages that we modified from upstream, like small patches in there. I think currently, we don't have any of those anymore. And then there's obviously the repositories with the software we built ourselves. So these packages, these repositories, go to a promotion where we say, hey, this is stable, this is where development is being bootstrapped from. It's a combination of the upstream packages with our own development. And these are being promoted to production. So each time we have a full snapshot of a repository with the dependencies, with the packages in there that we need to be able to bootstrap a box with a certain functionality. And that pattern actually has been working pretty well for us. Um, so the way we promote packages here is using Jenkins, obviously. Um, Jenkins for us, it's one of the cornerstones of our infrastructure. It builds us a bunch of pipelines, and it allows us to sequence a number of jobs in a certain order, where we start from checkout, and it basically ends on deployment. And from a developer point of view, it gets pushed, and then it gets a mail with a link. You can see if stuff works. And our pipeline stuff, for example, this is our, this is actually one of the really, really old screenshots. September 2013, um, of what our private pipeline did. Because we take the same pattern from an operating system point of view, from an OS point of view, we package the code that deploys the infrastructure and we do exactly the same. Because how would we be capable of supporting developers if we don't use the tools ourselves? If we don't do continuous delivery of our own stack, how can we teach developers how to do continuous delivery? So as you see, these are all individual jobs, parameters being passed on, and well, it was green right at the end. And it was a simple pipeline. This is actually our media Moses pipeline in the early days. We do some tech checkout, we do some testing, we do some more testing. Um, one environment, two environments, and we put production. Straightforward, pretty simple. If today I would want to build this and use pipeline detail, it's going to go straightforward, really easy. But then things started changing. We needed to have more pipelines, more jobs, more complexity in there. And um, well, back in these days, if you created a job like this, if you wanted to create a new job like that, 
basically went to the Jenkins UI and said, create new job from, you copied all the damage you did in the first job, and you moved it to another job. And then you updated the most recent one, but you never updated the original one. And that didn't work. And I think over the course of four or five years, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out how to orchestrate these things, how to manage these things. Um, I think Julian's initial work was taking the XML files from Jenkins, turning them into ERB files, and creating a Puppet module that would generate those jobs again. That didn't work very well. It worked for a while, but once we started modifying those jobs, it became more complex. Then we started looking into the Jenkins Job Builder. Um, the OpenStack guys were using that. Uh, OpenStack is abandoned on Jenkins, and that community has slowly died. But the Jenkins folks themselves started figuring out, hey, we need to have some kind of things in there. And they started doing job DSL. So that's what we eventually settled with. Um, we're using the Jenkins job DSL, not the Jenkins pipeline DSL, because it allows us much more flexibility, and it allows us to break things down into this. And this looks like chaos. This looks like a bunch of jobs being built. And if you would have just this part, which was the original job, it would be great. But this is what this talk is going to be about. It's going to be about taking that software as a service platform and building it on prem. Because hey, we've got all the components in place, right? We've got everything to do this. We've got researchers' code, we've got pipeline's code. It's just, just about adding a new target here. This is just another customer where you want to have the complexity, you want to have the exact same code and reuse that. And this is yet another customer who also has its promotion targets. And there's like five of them down there with exactly the same code base. So this is what we use it for. Jenkins Job DSL. For those who don't know, it's Groovy based, it's pretty flexible. Um, for our use case, it's more suited than the job diesel, I than the pipeline diesel. I mean, we review this every six to nine months if we shouldn't be using the R plugin. Um, the last time we did the checkout, it was still not at a point where we would change. And we basically have a large number of C jobs, which are generating all of those pipelines depending on the config file. So if we have a new customer, like the seven feet down here, it's four lines of YAML and the pipelines are being generated for us completely. So those are being rebuilt on a grid commit and we have a number of patterns now where we can basically do Puppet, Python, PHP, a number of Java stacks, and we build those tools so we can easily and fastly spin up new stacks. So we have the same pipelines, the same tools, the same patterns being used by both developers and operations people. So if there is a problem, if there is pain somewhere, it's everybody. Else. Everybody will feel that part. So this is deployment in a software as a service stack. Um, this is control deployment. This is automated. These are the four cornerstones of the DevOps movement. So let's talk about measurement. How do you measure such? How do you do monitoring in such a stack? Well, We've been a long time the Kindle users. Um, we basically monitor everything which moves in our stack. And we do this based on infrastructure as code principles. We use Puppet's functionality of using exported resources and sort configs, which means that if we define what our web server should look like in the definition, in the profile definition of that web server, we also write, and by the way, you should be checking this, 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 this. Those definitions are being exported. Our Kinga service pick up that definition, they connect all the data, and they regenerate the configuration file. So if we deploy a new service, if we deploy a new node, it's automatically being monitored. There is no manual work for us to do when we provision new services, when we add new nodes. Everything is monitored out of the box, which is kind of what you want from a monitoring system, which is what for a lot of people was the real pain in monitoring such that monitoring was not in sync with reality anymore. And by using infrastructure as code, we would solve that. So that just basic checks like, is this thing on? 
does this thing work? We also do stuff with log files. We ship all of them. We were early log stash adopters. We are still using log stash for all of those things. Um, we ship all the log files we have. System logs, Drupal logs. We interpret them, we've built filters for them, we build dashboards for them, and our developers basically use those dashboards when they've got problems. Um, typical stack. We used to ship them over our syslog. We are using Beats more to ship those logs. But we then take a bunch of those dashboards, we send them to StatsD, StatsD, and send those things to Graphite. We display them with Grafana. There's two kinds of logs which we care about. It's basically the ones where we want to search for things and we really want to search now. And then there's the things which we don't really care about that much, where we care about derived metrics. Because sure, our Apache usage last January was interesting in last January, but I only want to see the pattern about it. So that's when we use things like flush them to stats the end, we drop them the actual log file, but we still keep the derived metric. Which brings me to the next part of the stack, which is basically we use collect the graphite and grafana to measure all the things. Um, if it moves, we measure it. If we aren't sure about measuring it, we're still going to measure it because we can never recreate metrics, but we can always throw them away. Application metrics, database metrics, things which we derive from log files, like I said before, but also more relevant business metrics, like how many people have been using this platform, how is this platform being used, those kind of things. And we share a lot of those things as actually open source. Uh, a lot of the things were public open source module back in the early days. We've refactored a bunch of them to use more upstream things, but a lot of those things are still available. So, that's how we manage a software as a service stack. And because we were doing that, we could actually do this with a really small number of people. Uh, the total operations team was running <coughs> a stack like that. It's, just, it's not even one FTE. It's less than one person who spends time on managing that stack. We have a couple of that. Media Mozo is one, but we have we actually have a full IoT platform, we have a track and trace platform, we have um, billing systems, which we run and manage that way. But then you have the business side. We built that platform initially for the Dutch SwiftNet, um, for the academic use of that platform. And it was fine, but it was built for them. We wanted to run it for other customers. So we said, well, do you want to have it running on your network? Because, you know, university network bandwidth so if it's like Bell and uh, they have their own bandwidth, if they talk about streaming and they need to talk about peering agreements with ISPs and there's going to be a lot of data, they want to do it on their own network because they have their own network. So we couldn't actually host that in our data centers because there was going to be expensive traffic. So we're like, okay, we have two instances, one. academic one, commercial one. Okay. We have all the public code, we have all the monitoring, we can just spin that up. And the first time we spun up a new stack, it took us about four hours, which is okay. I mean, spinning up like 40 VMs, four hours, making sure that everything actually still works, verifying. Um, and then we started going to the market with this thing, because people saw the use for this, and they said, hey, we can either build this ourselves, or we can, well, let you do this. And today we actually have two academic instances running, our own commercial SaaS platform, and we have two more customers who have this on-prem, because they want it on-prem, for all the wrong reasons. And this is not a technical part, but these are all the wrong reasons why people want to have these things on-prem. The cloud, even in 2018, most CIOs still don't believe in the cloud, or software as a service, <laughs> as sad as that is. Um, we had an academic customer who wanted to have a private tenant for privacy and security. They fully audited us. And they came up with a number of minor security through obscurity things, like please obfuscate these versions, so attackers won't actually attack the versions they don't recognize. 
Um, the other part is there is a SAM bar running, or there is actually a NetBeast running on that Windows server. We don't use Windows. Oh, oh, then we've been actually trying to assess the wrong target. So for a security reason, by people who couldn't actually do a good security assessment. Um, the other reason, which is more typical, is public tenders. You get a budget to spend, and you need to spend that budget this year. And no, you cannot spread that budget over paying a subscription for the next five years. You need to spend the money now. So what do you do? You buy a shitload of hardware, you put it in a data center somewhere, and by the time you're actually going to use it, it's going to be deadly slow because it's four-year-old hardware you bought. But you did the investment of the hardware, so you need to have, this platform is talking about video, large data sets. So if you bought a couple of petabytes of storage, where you're only going to need like, I think they're currently using seven terabytes, bought a couple of petabytes, you need to do this on your hardware. So yeah, okay. Yeah, sure, the software as a service solution charges for storage unit, but yeah. Or, well, the other customer said, hey, we want you to do this in our custom environment, and we're going to run on Debian. We're going to use Chef. And can you please come and deploy this with us? And we got a budget for about three days. Sure, we spent about two years in monitoring and metrics and figuring out how to tune a number of those tools, like how to deal with event big internals. And sure, we're going to give you all that knowledge in three days and do it with Chef, because that's what our business is about. This was literally questions we got from customers. So, okay, well, you, you cannot do this. What about you then bring up your stack and run it internally with us? Sure, but that's not going to be exactly the same as what we are running. Even though we've automated everything, even though we do infrastructure as code, pipeline as code, and we build software and we write software in a continuous delivery mindset. It looks trivial, but it isn't. Why not? Well, you're going to do biased automation. You're going to do automation that works for your patterns. It's going to work in your infrastructure, with your constraints, with your expectations. Expectations like, we're going to run Postgres. Oh, and they're running Umbrella. We're going to run Jenkins. That's an Appalachian shop. We're using Apache, but there's actually standardized on Nginx. And while that might not be the biggest problem in the world to solve, if you need to automate for those things, you're never going to support that the whole stack. So trivial things like host names are going to be problematic because You've standardized um, naming conventions. Um, if you spin up a host called this, regular expression is going to match. And a host called MySQL with a number is going to be part of a cluster. And it's going to figure out which node it's going to need to boot up. Because you just wrote in your puppet code because you agreed with all the rest of your team members that all the nodes are going to run the database. It's going to be MySQL 0, 1, 2, whatever, dot environment the project name because you have full control over that stack and the first thing the customer is going to say is we're going to prefix all of your hosts oh well that means I'm just going to open up like 10 files and replace the regular expressions with not to match on the first part it's a trivial change but it's not going to be the only one because you've written code which is biased towards your standards. And that's where the costs start. The more complex things is going to be VM provisioning. We have bare metal. We spin up VMs using libvirt. Spinning up a VM for us is four lines in the public manifest. It's a host name, it's a CPU type, it's a memory. It runs. How many times do you think we got bare metal access to spin up those? 
zero times. I'm already playing on barely managed OpenStack setups. We we'll change the layout every single couple of months. We're deploying on VMware. We're deploying on AWS. And every single stack is different. We never had to have support in our platform for <coughs> VMware tools because we would never, as an open source company, run VMware. But we do now because we run the same platforms on customer stacks. Spinning up VMs in all of these environments, which one did you think was the most difficult one? Which one did you think we actually had most stability issues with? OpenStack. No, VMware. <laughs> the moment you talk storage and VMware, it's fucked. I'll go back to storage later. So, network topologies. Really simple things. If we build something internally, I have full control over my network. I can actually say, hey, if it's a machine which is in the 192.168.40 range, it's going to be a database. I've got full control over that stack. Not when I'm on a customer network. I get DHCP, or I get 40 IP addresses. A lot of the logic you think about when you design your own platform is not going to be around. So network topologies are going to be different. They might actually say, hey, we're going to have more interfaces in your machines, which you don't need, but well, you get them anyhow. Um, <laughs> you get them anyhow in the point where they all plug interfaces and give the ACP address to it. We had that happen. Um, one of the University of Groningen platforms, our Elasticsearch was running there. Actually, I'm jumping into the security part already. Um, it's on a private network. It's our log stash. There's no authentication on that. There's no authorization. We just ship logs there. We query it. It's our network. If somebody has access to that, it means he's on our network. Till the moment, I'll plug an interface in there. And suddenly, it has a public IP. That was not fun. <laughs> the provisioning means that if I'm running on my hypervisor, if I'm running on my customer, my network, sorry, I reboot the box when I want to, because I have full access. If I have to deploy on-prem at a customer and I have to call their knock because they need to reboot the VM, because it's actually it's broken at 3 a.m. in the morning, as opposed to, I'm just going to reboot this now. Or resource management. Can you please add a disk? And then you end up into corporate purchasing needing a disk. Yeah, but we told you we're going to need 100. And we're going to need two gigs. We're going to need, oh, sorry, we're going to need two terabytes. You gave us one. Please get us another one. If I have to do it in my own network, it's going to take me 10 minutes. But I need to grow to a customer. So it's a lot more complex to do that on prem with a customer than to do that in your own network. Security. Yeah. So we were lucky in, in a way that. Up till now, we've always been able to get a full IPsec link into the customer's network. I mean, that was also a prerequisite for us. If we didn't get that link, we're never going to build it. Because we, we're running that as a service. We need to be able to do monitoring metrics and all those things. We need to have full access. We need to have access to our puppet masters. We need to have access to be able to sh ship or replicate our repositories in there. But that also meant that our internal network complexity has grown enormously. I mean, from the part where we had three of our own data centers with our subnets connected, there is now a lot of customer networks where we need to take into account that we cannot overlap, that we need to figure out routing, that we had to reduce stuff like GRE tunnels over um, IPsec to get BGP going to do that routing. There's also a completely different mindset we need to take care of. I mean, we built our network and we put a firewall around it. We make sure that those devices are not connected. And we trust to a certain level, our own network. The moment you go into a customer network and you need to deploy there, it's actually a hostile network. Because you cannot trust what's going on in there. You have no clue what the machine on the same set is going to be that they're going to boot up next to you. Because it's not your own network anymore. So you need to think differently about how you're going to be firewalling all these things. You need to be different about encryption. And then there's user management. 
it's our stack. So customers don't need to be on there. But now they think it's their stack, and they want access, even with only access. So up till now, we actually have managed to say no and keep that as a no. But I'm pretty sure that one day that they will come there and say, hey, it's our hardware. We want to have access on there. We want to have agents deploy there, which we don't really want. So we've gone from one fully controlled software as a service stack, which we manage, where we do deployments, where we have full control, to a lot more variants, where people who own those variants want exceptions. And those are not the exceptions we might actually want. Um, can you add this web server on top of it? Can you deploy this static HP or this static code on there? Like, yeah, but the stack is doing this. Yeah, but otherwise we need to spin up a new web server. Yeah, yeah but you can add it. Yeah, but you bought this product, which the reason why you bought it is to reduce cost, and now you're adding more complexity and more of those custom features, which we needed to codify, which we needed to put in exceptions for. You can do all of that, but the complexity of your code base starts to grow. And you're not benefiting from all the exceptions, and you're not benefiting from the complexity. And maybe one of the biggest problems is that in a lot of cases, we couldn't do continuous deployment anymore. We couldn't do security patching and bug fixing at the moment we decided to make one. We had to start coordinating with a number of people like, hey, uh, we know it's not going to be intrusive. We're going to do a rolling update of all the stacks, but we still are telling you. And maybe that was one of our mistakes that we started telling people we were doing that. And then they said, oh, no, can you hold off? Can you, can you do it out of time? Uh, well, actually, no, because we're going to do all of them. And well, you're. So a lot of the overhead came into communicating with the customers that you're going to do this, whereas if you're running a software as a service product, they don't care. They don't see that. But it's on-prem now. And they're sometimes in monitoring box. And then if you reboot a VMware box, they'll actually see an alert popping up in their monitoring system, which they're not even supposed to do. So even for security fixes, we were not fully in control anymore. Um, yeah. So the only part where we were actually still in control is our own stack. So the thing comes down to there's an, an extreme cost difference between building a stack and even having multiple instances of that stack under your for, full control, as opposed to running more and more additional stacks onto customer premises. Because the pragmatic approach you take for a number of things is not going to work anymore for their infrastructure. The security features you want might need to be adapted. Storage is a fun part. I mean, we run Gluster internally, but we get a bunch of storage variants to store our data on on prem, and they might not all behave similarly. It's a different cost, um, and it takes a lot more time to deal with a bunch of things because you have less ways to move around. Simple example was some DBA work we needed to do a couple of weeks ago where three terabyte, three terabyte table needed to be purged. Okay, that's easy. I'm just gonna do an optimize and clean it out and it's not gonna work. Oh, I don't have that disk space available anymore. I need twice the disk space I need, I don't have it anymore. So we do an acceptance on our platform, we do an introduction on our platform, I grow the disks, add the required disk I need, do the database work, clean up, resize the disk again, problem solved. You need to do the same on prem with a customer. Oh, I don't have the disk space. Oh, I know I cannot add the disk space. I can add a slow volume. I can have an NFS mapped, but I cannot grow the disk. I might be able to grow the disk next month, but I need to do this now, or we're going to run out of disk space. And rather than having a 10 minute action to clean up data you don't need anymore, you're actually spending a couple of hours figuring out different alternatives, 
into how can I solve this? How can I actually work around this problem rather than move on and improve your own platform? So the complexity of the work you're doing because of those constraints is going really, really further. But it could have been much worse. And I see it's a lot worse for a lot of companies. Because we're an open source company. We only use open source tools. We choose open source over any proprietary alternatives or, or, or even over any cloud alternatives, which means that we could actually deploy our monitoring and our metric system because it was open source. Imagine we chosen a cloud-hosted platform for monitoring or metrics or log shipping in about, actually, in, I think in only one customer case, we could have used it. Because on all the other customers, it was been firewalled off. We could not get outside access. We couldn't even get to our own repositories without the IP segments. So how would you have done that without using open source tools? We also have no additional license costs because of that. So it is because we were using open source that even though it could have been much worse, it still was feasible. But I think that's my last piece of advice. If you have a software as a service stack somewhere and it's running and you have users on there and they ask to, to build this and deploy this on-prem, just don't. It's not worth the hassle. All of those problems will be solvable to Ansible. All of those problems will be solvable to Ansible, yeah. yeah. <laughs> You're going to grow disks you don't have access to to Ansible. Yeah, yeah, not those problems, but the others, one, other ones. Mm -hmm. Which ones? Uh, the deployment ones and uh, other, other stuff, like deploying the software stack on different platforms. Yeah. I don't see how deploying those stacks would be different with Ansible than with any other tool. You don't? No. The problem is not kickstarting the machine and getting from there. The problem is getting the fucking VM up and running. <laughs> <laughs> it would be solvable with Terraform, but we would be writing different Terraform stuff because they were using different providers for all of that. Yeah, but you know, you can uh, de deploy like Terraform with Ansible. I, I don't see where, which problem you're going to solve with Ansible. Maybe, maybe I'm missing something here, but the problems we ran into, I don't see how Ansible would solve them. Tell to a VMware cluster to spin up a machine and you only have eight VMs and resources. I mean, if I do it with Ansible or if I do it with Puppet, that's not going to change the difference. Yeah, that's true. Another question in back. Um, have you considered um, considering your production as another on-premise with different configuration? So development takes into consideration that that may have that will happen, not may. We do now, but we didn't do initially. <laughs> the. The thing is, when you, when you build a platform like that, you go for a minimal viable product and you don't try to over-engineer it. And there's a number of biased decisions you take because you know that this is the ecosystem which you're going to work in. And some of those decisions actually mean that, yes, it means we're going to choose Gluster as a storage system, which means that if we end up in a customer using something else, we're going to need to make some adaptions. Um, we actually have support for S3 in the stack, but only one customer ever one actually only one user ever used it. There was a patch in the platform, it could be done, but we engineered to use Gluster for all this stuff. And you could engineer for a lot of more, but there's the, the reality is that the business use case, which you're not gonna build stuff you are not gonna directly benefit from. More questions? Everybody's thirsty. Thank you, Chris.